Hey everybody, welcome back and thanks for tuning in to East Wing Vintage Woodworking. You know, I apologize, it's been four months since our last video. It was a really busy summer. You know, the combination of kids sports, my full-time job and getting our woodworking projects completed on time, you know, really made it difficult to produce new content. So I just wanted to take the next couple of minutes to talk to you a little bit about the direction our YouTube channel and woodworking business is going in and how that pertains to the project we're gonna show you today. In order to do this, we need to take a step back to add some context. You know, when we decided to make a YouTube channel, we thought a good place to start would be showing you how we make our plate stands. Now, I have to admit, they weren't the most popular videos by far, but I want to point out that our plate stands still remain our number one seller. My point is, if you watch those videos, you can see that making this product is very labor intensive. Another factor that needs to be considered is the cost component. See, on any given weekend, I might get an order for say 15 plate stands, and it takes approximately one hour to complete each unit. So my material cost runs about seven to $14 per board foot, and we sell them between 38 and $48 a piece. So not to go too far down the rabbit hole here, but it doesn't take too much brain damage to figure out we're not making much margin on every piece we sell. So herein lies the problem. How do we increase our production, decrease our time of labor, and maintain quality control. So I spent a lot of time on the internet and YouTube trying to research a solution to this problem. And one of the things I found out that was very interesting is the woodworking community's increased use of CNC routers. Why? Well, almost every one of these CNC users has a product they manufacture that needs to be produced in large volume in a short amount of time, and they still have to maintain quality control. Now, at the end of the day, this was all the proof I needed to realize that a CNC router would be the best solution to my problem. Approximately two months ago, I pulled the proverbial trigger on a CNC router purchase. Now, I'm not going to tell you which one I purchased yet, but I'm going to save that for a future video. I will also share with you all the features and benefits and why I went with this particular manufacturer. Now, while I was waiting for my CNC router to be delivered, I knew I needed a table or a cabinet to set the machine on. So in today's video, I'm going to show you the step-by-step -step process of how I built my CNC cabinet. Now, when I thought about the idea of what my CNC cabinet would look like, I knew that it had to contain several design features. Most importantly, it needed to be sturdy enough to support the machine. Next, I'd like the cabinet to have its own dust collection. After that, I'd like to have, say, like a set of drawers that I could use to you know, hold all the accessories and bits in that I would use for the machine. And lastly, I would love to have some sort of an enclosure that would allow me to keep the noise and dust to an absolute minimum. After looking at countless videos online, I finally settled on a cabinet project produced by Hunter White at Engineering Workshop. Hunter's video had every design element I was looking for and even included some other ideas I hadn't thought of yet, like the idea of adding casters to give me the option to move the cabinet around my shop. So if you'd like to see his video, please click on the link above. And if you're interested in building this cabinet for yourself, you can find and purchase plans for this build on Hunter's Etsy store, Engineering Workshop. The plans are detailed, very easy to follow. But make no mistake, Hunter is an experienced woodworker and an engineer, and by the way, he is also an active duty U.S. Army Special Forces operator. So I just want to pause for a second to recognize Hunter for his service to our country. You know, men and women like Hunter put their lives on the line for our freedom every day, and they deserve our respect and support. So thanks again. So as I mentioned earlier, in today's video, we're going to feature the cabinet build. Our next video is going to be the assembly of the CNC router, and after that, the final chapter is going to be the building of the enclosure. So without further ado, Let's get started. My name's Eddie, and this is East Wing Vintage Woodworking. I downloaded the plans into a nice little booklet to make things easy to follow through the project. Panning around the room here, you can see the boxes for the CNC machine as well as all the lumber for the cabinet. All right, so first things first, we're going to measure out some two by fours and get them cut up so we can start assembling our frame. The plans called for all the two by fours to be milled, uh, bring in their final dimensions to roughly just under one and a half inches thick by three inches wide.
The milling process did take a considerable amount of time. As you know, construction grade lumber can be pretty inconsistent. So uh, going through this process actually, in the end, uh, made for a much finer result. plants call for the 2x4 frame to be lap jointed so I'm replacing my table saw blade with a dado blade to make the process a lot faster. As you can see the dado blade makes cutting these lap joints much faster. Taking a close look you can see that I use my fence as a stop so every cut is consistent. Looks like everything fit according to plan, so just now putting the first frame together and making sure everything is square. Here I am joining all the pieces for the second frame. The plans call for pocket holes to join the braces to the frames. Personally speaking, I've never been a big fan of pocket holes in general, but using this pocket hole clamp really makes a big difference and keeps the wood from moving around on you when you go to screw everything up. All right, so we successfully created the frame. Next step is to cut a rabbit into the sides and the rear of the frame. This way we can inlay the half inch pieces of plywood. If you take a close look, you'll notice that the rabbiting bit rounds out the corners, so you're going to need to take a chisel to square up the corners. Right here, I'm adding caster blocks to the bottom of the frame. The casters are three inches in diameter and uh, are rated to hold up to 300 pounds each. I'm using two inch long galvanized lag bolts to attach the casters to the frame. Now that that's completed, the next step is to take all of my plywood 
and cut it to their specific dimensions per the directions. So project plans called for three quarter inch and half inch oak veneer plywood. At the time of this recording, four by eight sheets of oak veneer plywood were running about $180 a sheet. Sheet, that's expensive. So for economic reasons, I opted out of the oak veneer and went with an imported Baltic birch at a much more reasonable $60 a sheet. I'm adding glue here as the next step is to construct the bottom of the cabinet. If you take a close look here, the plans call for the corners of the plywood to be notched out so they'll fit just right inside the frame. I'm using an 18 gauge brad nailer to secure the plywood to the frame. Next step is to cut out and add the center divider, which is going to go inside the frame. This will be used to separate the right and left side drawers. I'm using two inch construction grade screws to secure this piece. And we're using pocket holes to secure the bottom to the frame. Just making sure this is center and square to the frame. All right, moving right along, the next step is to add the side panels. To secure the back panel, I'm not using any glue or brad nails. Instead, I'm going with screws, as I'd like to be able to remove this back panel in the future in case I want to make any electrical modifications or modifications to the dust collection. Okay, so next step is to add the three quarter inch plywood uh, to make our tabletop. So here I am removing the back panel so I can get access to the inside of the cabinet to secure the top. 
So as I mentioned earlier, using screws to secure the back panel uh, was the right call. I purposely made the top a little oversized so I can come back with a trim router and hit it with a flush trim bit. Here I'm laying out my spacers for my drawer slides. Now I'm using uh, some double sided carpet tape to temporarily connect them to the side panel. Then that way I can just come through once everything is level, hit it with the drill and screws and tack everything down nice and tight. As you can see, using the double-sided carpet tape was really helpful. It was almost like having an extra hand as I screwed these pieces in place. Adding the drawer slides. I purchased these drawer slides off of Amazon. I believe they came in a box six pair, and I think they're rated to hold between 60 and 80 pounds each. If you're interested, I'll put a link in the description below. Time to assemble all of our drawers. Earlier, I cut all the pieces for my drawers and added this quarter inch dado to secure the bottom. The construction of these drawers is really simple. Just butt joints, adding some glue and some 18 gauge brad nails. These are three quarter inch pieces of plywood that I'm cutting out to use for the drawer faces. As you can see here, this is a pretty common trick of using stacks of playing cards to act as spacers to evenly uh, separate your drawer faces. I'm using clamps here to secure the drawer face while I screw them into place. Before I attach my left side drawer face, I need to construct the panel that's going to hold this electrical equipment. This is what's going to run the machine, the spindle, the dust collection, and the lights. In Hunter's video, he constructs a customized control panel with all individual switches and runs the wiring to individual outlets that manage each component of his machine. I decided just to keep things a little bit simpler and have all of that incorporated in one unit. As you can see here, I'm going through the exercise of measuring 15 times and cutting once. As you probably can tell by now, this panel is typically used for things like stereo and audio visual equipment, but for my purposes, it actually worked out quite well. I'm pretty pleased with it and how it operates.
tweet. So far, I'm really pleased with how this has turned out. So now it's time to add some trim. In choosing my trim pieces, I decided to go with mahogany. It was a much cheaper price point than walnut, and uh, it turned out pretty nice. Again, I'm using the double-sided carpet tape trick to hold it in place and make sure that it's exactly where I want it. All right, here we are into the home stretch. Uh, my favorite part of every project, which is sanding. So uh, sit back and enjoy. So here I am following the author's recommendations uh, by using shellac to preserve the cabinet. You know, it's a great product. I've used shellac a lot in the past. Uh, it's a great coating. It goes on very well. Actually looks great and lasts a lifetime. If you take a close look, adding the shellac to the mahogany trim, uh, really darkens it up a little bit and it's a nice contrast to the rest of the cabinet. I think it looks great. So here's our completed cabinet. I apologize that I added the drawer handles off camera, but I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please smash that like button and subscribe. Hope to see you next time on East Wing Vintage Woodworking. Take care.